Bless the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. I was getting ready to say, did you hear that? <laughs> uh, that's why there's a scripture that says, Bless are the people who hear the sound. What do they think that sound is? That's that's when Yeshua calls us home. That voice of trumpet, which is his voice himself when he calls us home. This is what makes uh, this time of year particularly special for those who have been around me for a while. You've heard me say that the wheat first fruits rapture will occur in the spring. That's when it will occur, not the fall. You know, some people say, well, you got the Feast of Trumpets. That's what it's going to be. Well, no, not really, because the word is actually teruah, yom teruah, day of shouting or day of blowing. But there's all kinds of reasons why it could be a day of blowing. It could be announcing of a coronation. It could be announcing of a wedding. It could be announcing of, of the second coming. Whatever. So there's a lot of things that Yom Teruah can mean. But we know that in the scriptures it tells us that the wheat first fruits will be a rapture just like the barley first fruits. Well, the wheat first fruits, is, you know, we'll be here in about a month. And uh, the barley first fruits rapture occurred right on the barley first fruits. But this is a wonderful time of the year. I love it. You know, many churches around the world are this weekend will be celebrating Easter. You know, we prefer to call it Resurrection Sunday. But we, uh, we also understand that the more, the following the lunar calendar is the best way. And that's why April 22nd, Passover, will really represent the, that period of time. Not so much Easter. Do you know how Easter came, what, how they came up with this date for Easter? Is what? Not a no, no, that's not what I mean. Not the date. I to come up with a date. It's because, yeah, because it's the closest Sunday to the spring equinox. That's how they come up with Easter. The closest Sunday to the spring equinox. So uh, when people tell me that, I say, well, chapter and verse, please. Where does it say that in the Bible? That's how you figure that out. God goes by a lunar calendar. You know, we know that, you know, Passover, he was crucified. and leavened bread, he was buried. Barley first fruits was Resurrection Sunday. And, uh, you know, so that would be occurring toward the end of April this year. So where do they come up with this, you know, closest Sunday to the spring equinox? Well, that was the Catholic Church back when it was, didn't want to do anything more Hebraic. And they were isolating themselves and pulling away from Hebraic roots. They, but they still wanted to celebrate the resurrection, so they come up with this concept. Otherwise, it, fa- it falls different all the time. But the interesting thing is, is, is not the resurrection falls different, because we know the resurrection was on a Sunday. And so what happens is, is that the seven days of unleavened bread, the scriptures in Leviticus 23 says, and on, on, and on the Sabbath day you shall count uh, uh, 50 days from that point for the wheat first fruits. So the Sabbath day on the seven day feast of unleavened bread changes every year. You know, so one year you could be celebrating the resurrection Sunday. Uh, on, well, it's always going to be on a Sunday, but the unleavened bread date moves around because it's on a lunar calendar concept. And that's why it's also seven days. And in seven days, somewhere in that seven days, there's going to be a weekly Sabbath. And so that's why Leviticus 23 says, the day after the weekly Sabbath, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you will have uh, the barley first fruits. But that means, you know, it, it can move. But, but, you know, the early, or the church did not like that. They wanted to set a more definitive time on that. So they decided the closest Sunday to the spring equinox. That's why sometimes uh, Easter and Passover are really close to one another, if not even on the same day. It's possible. But a lot of times it can be off by several weeks from one another. So that's why it's better to follow the lunar calendar. That's God's calendar. It's his calendar. You know, man comes up with their idea of, the, you know, how to do calendars. And, but we like God's calendar. That's what's important. And, of course, you're know, looking at, you know, man's calendar right now. You know, we, uh, yesterday would have been what they call Good Friday, uh, with the day that he was crucified. 
And I guess you could call it good because it was a good thing he died for us. It was very good. But it brought to my mind when I was hearing about it, about the crucifixion itself. I always get a big kick out of all the songs that are on a hill, far away, high up on all these songs that are on a hill. He was not crucified on a hill. That is just man's idea of how it worked. Where he was crucified was on the Damascus Road there in Jerusalem and the place of stoning and the place of execution in front of that skull called, called Golgotha. If you've ever seen it in Jerusalem, it looks just like a skull. That's where he was crucified. <laughs> and, and the logic of that is you have to think about the logic. The Romans wanted to make an example of anybody they calling, they're saying they're rebellious. They want to make an example of it. So to put it on a hill far away and put the name King of the Jews on the top of it, who could read that? How would they know why he was crucified? They don't. So where do they do it? They crucify him, they said, right on the Dama side of the Damascus Road, which is the busiest road in Jerusalem. So that's where the crucifixion took place, is right next to the Damascus Road. And so they put their vertical stakes along that road, and then the cross is actually a cross beam, they nail him to, and they carry it to the vertical pole. And then they lift him up on the vertical pole uh, and then nail his feet in. And by the way, he's standing on the ground when they lift him up on the vertical pole. He's standing there. And he's looking at the busiest road in Jerusalem, and everybody walking down that road is looking right at him, eye to eye, close, right at him. And they're looking up and seeing the sign. And once they got him up on the pole, they bend his knees up, and then they, ang they hammer his feet into the vertical pole. So he's pretty much with eye level on the busiest road in Jerusalem. People walking by. I can imagine a lot of them going, I'm not looking, I'm not looking. I need to get from point A to point B, but I'm not going to look at this guy. But the Romans wanted to make an example. They're not going to crucify somebody on a hill far away and, and, and let it go at that because people won't be changed. People won't. Think, well, I better obey whatever the Romans say. They won't be thinking that. That's out of sight, out of mind. You know, I can look away and not see anybody dying up on a hill. But when it's right next to the road and you can hear it moaning and crying coming from anybody that's crucified there, particularly the two thieves and uh, that were with the Messiah. So that's where it took place. Now, how do I else do I know that's the place? Because there's a bus station there. Today it's an Arab bus station. And when they were excavating that bus station to lay the foundation down, they found all kinds of bones and finger bones and everything else right there in front of the skull. It was a place of execution. It was a place of stoning. And that's where they took Yeshua to Golgotha because it looked like a skull. And that's where he, the execution took place. So uh, keep that in mind, you know, that he was not on a hill. That's a nice romantic idea. He was up on a hill somewhere. But it wasn't on the hill. He was right there on the side of the road looking right at you when you walked by. And you could read the sign, King of the Jews, written on the different languages, uh, in Greek and Latin and, and uh, Hebrew. Otherwise, nobody could read a sign way up on a hill somewhere and had no idea why he was being tortured and killed. So it was right there next to the road, uh, Damascus Road. And I, I've been there... Uh, I've talked to people who claim they have seen the uh, crevices in the rocks where they stuck the vertical poles in, if that's true or not. But they say that they can do that. I see those holes. And so, understand, that's how the crucifixion took place. Rome wanted to say, this could be you if you don't obey us. They wanted to make an example out of it. And that he was crucified right there. So... It's important to know these things and the whole concept about how long was he in the tomb? Three days and three nights. <clears throat> I reemphasize it. Three days and three nights. You can't take a little bit of that day and a little bit of that day and a little bit of that day and come up with three days and three nights. You can't do it. So it tells you he was crucified uh, on, on, on a, on a, and buried on a Tuesday night. That's when it happened. Tuesday night to Sunday morning, very early hours of Sunday morning, you can get three days and three nights. He was in the tomb. 
<coughs> and the sign would be like the sign of Jonah. Jonah would be in the well three days and three nights. Did you have a question, Steve? Yeah, I thought it was Wednesday night. Wednesday night to yeah, Thursday, to Wednesday. Friday to Saturday evening at sunset, and then he resurrected at sunset or right after sunset on the seventh, well, on the first day of the week, but it was still Saturday. Right. You're, you're right, Steve. Tuesday night was the beginning of Passover is what I guess I meant to say. Tuesday night was the beginning of Passover. And so so, 24-hour period of Tuesday night to Wednesday night where he was buried on Wednesday night. You're right. It was Wednesday night. Then you got three days and three nights in the tomb. And uh, why did they make it Friday? Why did they say Good Friday? They say Good Friday because they had to take him down because the Sabbath was at hand. And they assumed something that they should never assume. They assumed that it was a weekly Sabbath. It was not a weekly Sabbath. It was, there's seven other Sabbaths in the year other than the weekly Sabbath. And uh, the first day of unleavened bread is the Sabbath. And so, and it's also known as the high Sabbath, as John says. It's also the day of preparation, as the scripture says, to get all the leaven out of the house. So it was that Sabbath that was at hand. Passover is not a Sabbath. So they had to get him out of there before the Sabbath of unleavened bread began. Uh, and get him off the cross because the, the, the Jews say you can't leave somebody up on the cross on the Sabbath day. But there are seven other Sabbath days in a year other than the weekly Sabbath. And that was that day, the first day of unleavened bread where he was put in the tomb. That was a Sabbath day. And uh, so, uh, otherwise, how do you get three days and three nights? You know, in, in a tomb. You can't get three days and three nights on a Friday night crucifixion. You cannot. And so, and all because they misunderstood what the Sabbath day was. And uh, matter of fact, it's the different Sabbath days other than the weekly Sabbath. First and second day of unleavened bread, Shavuot, Yom Kippur, Yom Teruah, uh, first day of tabernacles, and then the Shemini Aseret, the eighth day. These are the seven Sabbath days other than weekly Sabbaths. And so, pretty simple, actually. You start seeing how it's plotted out. Uh, so, that's what the John calls the high Sabbath. That's what the high Sabbath. It wasn't a weekly Sabbath. And that's when it happened. It's important to understand how the Hebraic concepts work on these things. Because it gets you set on the right timetable. Gets you on God's time clock. And that's what where we want to be, on God's time clock. And so this coming week, we're going to have an eclipse. Uh, there's a lot of buzzing going on about that. <laughs> but you know what? Just make sure you're right with God. Make sure you're right with God. And we'll see what happens after that. Amen? All right, all right let's take two minutes and talk to our Lord. Glory to your name, Father. We ask you to come and tabernacle with us today in this house. Come and dwell with us today, Lord God, as we lift your holy name up, Lord. And Lord, you are holy. Yet in this season, we also, the Apostle Paul calls us unleavened, which means righteous. We're not righteous because 
of what we've done were righteous because of what your Son has done. For we are the righteousness of God. Thank you, Lord, for cleansing us. Thank you, Lord, for making us right in your eyes, Lord, where we can boldly come before the throne of grace. We thank you, Lord. And Lord, we just ask you to be in this house today and touch the hearts and minds of people in this house today. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen and amen. All right, let's worship the Lord. upon my heart I will dance like David danced when the spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart I will dance like David danced I will dance I I will dance like David danced. I will dance. I will dance. I will dance like David danced. When the spirit of the on my heart, I will dance like David danced. When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will dance like David danced. I will dance, I will dance, I will dance like David danced. I will dance, I will dance, I will dance like David danced.
what I long for Holiness is what I need Holiness, holiness is what you want from me Is what you want from me Is what you want Is what you want from me?
welcome each other in a Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Daniel. Some glad morning when this life is old, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore.
kingdom's all I wanna see. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being with us today. Welcome to our online viewers. Thank you for being with us. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, as always, we like to invite all of you, every uh, heir of Shabbat, every Shabbat, and we invite all of you that are watching, stop by and see us too. Uh, join us on Monday, April 8th, for our Erev Rosh Kodesh Nisan service. Uh, service from uh, 7 p.m. till 8.30 p.m. This is also the biblical New Year. So you don't want to miss this special monthly service filled with praise and worship to Adonai. The Ruach HaKodesh moves mightily, the Holy Spirit and we say that, but it's not lip service. <laughs> the Holy Spirit moves mightily during Rosh Kodesh. The Lord loves Rosh Kodesh. Otherwise, he wouldn't have commanded us to do this forever and ever and ever. So, uh, so join us Monday evening, April 8th. You won't leave the same way you came in, and that's the truth. Uh, Passover Seder. Monday, April 22nd, from 6 till 8 p.m. 
Come join us in the sanctuary for an interactive Passover Seder service. Say that three times real quick. <clears throat> Passover Seder service. On Monday, April 22nd, from 6 till 8 p.m., AMC will provide an in-person Passover Seder with the elements needed to participate in the service. Tickets are not required since there will not be a full meal. There is a sign-up sheet in the lobby so we know how many of the elements are needed. The Passover Seder service will... <laughs> I am having fun saying that. The Passover Seder service will also be available online if you're not able to attend. So come and feel the spirit flow and enjoy fellowship and dessert afterwards with your AMC family. And that's on Monday, April 26th, our Passover Seder service. Okay. Uh, there is a nursery in the back of the sanctuary for children if needed. The Shabbat school is available after the children are prayed for and released. Join us at 7 p.m. every Friday. I don't know why I have to read this. Join us at 7 p.m. every Friday evening for our Arab Shabbat service. Each week we have a different leadership team speaker bringing you the word of God. If you can't make our Shabbat morning service, join us on Friday evening for our Arab Shabbat service. Pretty good, huh? Well, you do it for 15 years. You should retain some of it. <laughs> Oh, and join us uh, every Shabbat morning from 8.30 till 9.30 here in the sanctuary where you can dive deeper into God's word by joining Pastor Greg for our Shabbat morning Bible study before our Shabbat service. And we invite you to worship with us at our Shabbat service every Saturday morning at 10.17. During our Shabbat services, we are on the offense against the enemy of our soul. We have instituted prayer circles that will consist of everyone in unity in a large corporate prayer circle praying for one another. So come with the full armor of God and expect results. Join Rabbi Allen every Tuesday evening. Yes, this coming Tuesday, Enoch class will start up again. Uh, join Rabbi Allen every Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary for AMC's adult education classes. During this series, come and be enlightened for what God is saying throughout the book of Enoch. Classes are open to the public as well as live streamed. Join Lanny and the AMC's dedicated prayer warriors every Thursday evening at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary for the corporate power hour of prayer meeting. Soaking and preparation begin at 6.30 p.m. So come join our prayer warriors as we go on the offense against the enemy. Uh, reminder that there will be elders and pastors available at the end of service for anyone that would like prayer. Please use the fellowship hall before and after services to visit with one another. And lastly, tune in every Saturday at 4 p.m. and every Sunday at 1 p.m. on KPXQ 1360 a.m. to hear Rabbi Allen's radio program for such a time and with that please welcome up elder Leticia and pastor Greg with the family blessings thank you pastor Denny Shabbat Shalom everyone <laughs> ladies you may be seated gentlemen we ask that you remain standing as this is the last Shabbat of the month we look forward to sharing the type of blessings they will be say in the home with our families. Let us now begin by speaking a special blessing over the men of our congregation. Ladies, join me as we join, join me as we extend our hands towards our husbands, fathers, and brothers. Hallelujah. How happy is anyone who fears Adonai, who greatly delights in his mitzvot. His descendants will be a powerful on earth, a blessed generation of upright people, wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness stands forever. You may be seated. All right, ladies. Um, all right, we have our ladies here. Would you please stand? We'd like to bless our wives, sisters and mothers. Gentlemen, please extend your hands toward our women and join me uh, in this blessing. Charm can lie, beauty can vanish, but a woman who fears Adonai should be praised. 
Give her a share of what she produces. Let her words speak her praises at the city gates. And uh, for our people online, this is the end of the month. We would like to, uh, actually, actually, I'm sorry, uh, we're going to bless our sons and our daughters. So first our sons. May God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. And for our daughters, may God make you as Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. Right? And uh, invite up uh, Rabbi Allen. He's going to uh, pray and bless the children. Okay. Helen, come on up here. <laughs> All right. Okay, congregation, raise your hands toward these little ones. Father God, we just ask your blessings upon these little ones, Lord. A new generation, Lord God, of people that will learn about you and speak of you and be bold in your name, Lord God. I just ask, Lord, that your word will penetrate their minds and their hearts, that they, the, your word will never leave them, Lord God. It will become a bread of life to them. Be like manna to them from heaven, Lord God. Let your word be permanently installed in their minds and hearts. We thank you in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen and amen. All righty. All right, let's all stand. As we continue with our worship service, let us pray in the manner that Yeshua taught his disciples to pray. We're going to be reading from the complete Jewish Bible. Matthew 6, verses 9b through 13. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us the food we need for today. Forgive us for what we have done wrong, as we too have forgiven those who have wronged us. And do not lead us into hard testing but keep us safe from the evil one. For kingship, power, and glory are yours forever. Amen. All right. Please remain standing again for the Barku, the Shema, the Viahafta, and the Viahafta Lariaka. Bless the Lord, the blessed one. Blessed is the Lord, the blessed one for all eternity. Barku et Adonai Hamevorak Baruk Adonai Hamvorak Leolam Vayed And now the Shema from Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And now the Via Hafta from Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 through 9. Love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your strength. These words which I am commanding you today are to be on your heart. You are to teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand. They are to be as frontless between your eyes and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And now the Viahafta Lariaka from Leviticus 19, verse 18b. But love your neighbor as yourself. And please remain standing again for the blessing of Messiah. Baruch Eta Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Natan Lanu HaDerek, the Yeshua Mashiach Yeshua, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way to salvation in Messiah Yeshua, Amen. And now Rabbi Allen for the Liturgy for Victory, Psalm 91. Join with me. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High 
shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at the noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, keep you in all your ways. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With a long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. So let's form a, a large prayer circle. Every time I read the Psalms 91, I'm reminded of a time that I was talking to a young man that believed that God was just an exalted man. And I said, why do you say that? Well, because it says right here, the hand of the Lord, the foot of the Lord, the head of the Lord, and all these kind of things. So they take all the symbolism and say, well, that means he was a man. So I've used this Psalm 91 and said, well, it also says he has wings and feathers. You believe that too? <laughs> it's all symbolism. All right, so. all right. All right. We all know how this is going to happen. We'll call out our prayers and then uh, we'll pray for them all corporately together at the end. So let your request be known to God now. <laughs> I'd like to pray for the whole body that the Lord will just saturate our hearts. I pray that we we'll get to a place in our spirit that we are more than ready for the Lord to return. Yes. I know there are many people who haven't heard yet. And we want you to hear, but we don't want him to delay. We're asking you to please, if you hear the Lord's voice, open your heart and let him in. He's only there to help you. He was helping you all your life. Yes, he Because nobody had to do anything for you. But it was by his compassion that people cared for you. And they brought you up. If you're doing stuff that you shouldn't be doing, stop it. Stop it now. You still have time to make the right choice. I pray for all of our sisters and brothers in Eric Israel, in the land, in Jerusalem. I pray for all of the people that are in this war, that they will come to the realization that their problem is not Israel. Their problem is they're following the wrong information. I pray that they'll repent and reach out to the living God. I don't know the other ones that they are trusting in, but I do know the living God is still available, and he's still saving people right now. Yes. And all his mercy was for this whole entire world. Come to your senses. 
Understand that Israel's not your problem. Your problem is the wrong information. Trust in the Lord, and he will restore you to the place that you felt like you would never see. I pray for all the people on my uh, a property that I live in. There was a lady, a quick praise report. She was dealing with some rough issues, and she came by my house and read my house rules and learned the name of Yeshua. <laughs> and she told me on Friday that she feels better, that those spirits aren't tormenting her like before. See, Yeshua is a powerful name. Y'all better come on and realize the time is getting late, people. I pray that everybody will just trust in the Lord. Amen. Continue prayers for Cindy Martin to, to raise her blood cell count and to keep on battling this fight and, and bring her back to good health so she can return. Mm -hmm. Continue prayers for the school for the blowing up. Sherry online needs prayer for her back and her hip and also prayer for the prodigal. Amen. Amen. that are protecting us, yes. the ones that stand outside and make sure that we're okay. Mm -hmm. I thank God for all the law enforcement, all of the emergency uh, responders, all of the, the people, the firefighters, everybody that's doing something for other people. I'm praying for you. All the people in the hospital that are in their sick beds, I'm praying for you that the Lord will raise you up and if he doesn't, you better know that he could. That's right. And sometimes the kindest thing that he would do is to let you enter into his peace. Yes. So trust in the Lord, and if you don't know him, get to know him. Call somebody. Call us. We'll help you. Mm -hmm. We'll tell you about him. Mm -hmm. We'll show you in demonstration of his power. He is real. Mm -hmm. I would like to pray for my husband, Larry, who is not feeling very well. He's under the weather, just to help him heal and get better. Father, I just lift up all these prayers, petitions, and supplications to you, Lord God. You heard them spoken, Lord God, and spoken with faith and believing that you will answer them, Lord. And we just ask you to take these prayers before your very throne, Lord God, and fulfill these requests. And so that we can glorify you and rejoice in you always. In Yeshua's mighty name. Amen and amen. Okay, we welcome up Pastor Greg.
Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the people online, uh, especially here. Thank you for the people, Lord, that are here today. Uh, and if you're watching online by the myamc.org website, third row from the bottom of the page, there's a click here to give button, and also a big red donate button. You can't miss it. If you're watching online by the YouTube uh, broadcast, the bottom part of the page, there's a section there where you can give also. So uh, with the message today uh, is part five uh, in this, it's actually part two of part five, and it's the title of the Divine uh, Omniscience of the Lord. Again, this was inspired by a book written by A.W. Tozer called Knowledge of the Holy. And again, uh, a lot of these teachings, I taught a little bit on this last night, but these are designed to draw us closer uh, into the knowledge of the attributes of God. We, we need to know God in a much, much deeper way than we do. We need to know more about him and, and, and be intimate with him. And so some of the things we're going to talk about uh, tonight, I mean, I, I can tell you, I was convinced <laughs> last night. I heard some of the things that I taught it even gave me a perspective so so hold on a little bit um, uh, there's a lot of benefits especially in these end times in knowing the Lord and honoring him uh, as Lord of our life we, we do not need to look at the Lord uh, as necessarily our, our buddy uh, going on with life and doing what we want to do God has tremendous blessings for us beyond what we can possibly imagine. Uh, he wants to bless us in ways we um, can't even imagine. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, like it says it's in the book of James, we need to do our part. And so we need to know him and the power of his resurrection. And so that's what these, uh, these, uh, these teachings are about. So we're going to talk a little bit uh, about his omniscience today. So what does this word mean? It comes from the Latin word omnis, meaning all, and scientia, science, or knowledge, actually. It's where we get our word science from. So he is all-knowing, right? So... Quote from John Wesley. John Wesley said this, Bring me a worm that can comprehend a man. Then I will show you a man that can comprehend God. <laughs> so, mull on that a little bit. It's, the omniscience of God is, is not preached about a lot. Um, uh, it's, Part of, I think, uh, the after effects uh, of postmodernism, right? Postmodernism, uh, it's, it's a movement that came in the late 80s and 90s, pretty much. Uh, it was characterized by broad skepticism, subjectivity, relativism. It's crept into the church, even. Uh, so uh, if you're postmodernist or come out of a postmodernist church, uh, you're skeptical of explanations which can claim to be valid uh, and that apply to all races, all groups, cultures, and tradition. And instead, what it focuses on, it focuses on relative truths uh, that are found in each person. All right, for instance, the Bible. The Bible isn't for some groups of people. It's, it's for all races. Um, it's the polar, polar opposite of saying and believing and living for an all-knowing all God. It's the exact opposite to that. To say and believe that God possesses perfect knowledge, and therefore, he has no need to learn. So pause. Think about that. God has no need to learn. He's never learned, and he cannot learn. He's the possessor of all knowledge. 
Have we gone through seasons in our life, perhaps, where we've tried to show something to God, show him something about ourselves that he doesn't already know, doing something? And so this is a hard pill. This is a hard pill for the unbelieving world to swallow. So this is, this is part of the challenge we have. But we see in the scriptures that God has never learned from anyone. Right? Isaiah 40, verses 13 and 14. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord? Or being his counselor, hath taught him? with whom he took counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding. Who, who, who's done that? Apostle Paul in Romans 11, verses 34 through 36, for who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him and all things to whom be glory forever and ever. And so from these, just from these two scriptures alone, we can say with all assurance that God cannot learn. Right? So imagine, imagine, imagine this. Imagine if God could receive some information into his mind that he hasn't possessed from all eternity, that he could learn something. <laughs> Imagine God sitting at the feet of another, a teacher, learning something that the Most High has never, ever knew. It's impossible. It's an impossibility. And we are reminded in the Word Whenever in the word we find God asking questions, it's always to bring the person he is asking the question of into the realization of the knowledge that he already has. He wants to bring us to a knowledge. He wants to reveal to us his truth. How can we possibly as a nation and as a world come to reverence for a holy God if we can conclude that we, we know him and that we can show him something, right? Second Chronicles 7.14, right? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, we cannot get to a point of humility if we believe that we can teach God. We cannot ever get to a point of humility as a nation if we don't understand that God is all-knowing about everything. We cannot come to a point of humility. And that's the only the first step in healing our nation, right? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, come to the understanding that God has all knowledge and can't learn anything, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then I will hear their prayer and heal them of their land. We haven't even started that yet. This, is, this stuff is not being taught. We need to come to the knowledge that we cannot teach God anything. And our, our ability to know him completely is the exact reason why, why we need to revere him. And, and we, we have the enemy working overtime. And we, we, we say we're in this age of grace, right? We're in the age of grace. But I'm here to tell you that grace that we see today being taught has distorted, has distorted our view of God. And, and that was never God's intent. 
but it's been distorted. When believers don't see their prayers answered the way we want them, we draw the conclusion that God's not hearing our prayers. We don't even talk about or believe that God truly is omniscient. We're aloof. We are aloof as a nation, presumptuous and mistaken to think and believe that God is going to do the miraculous and get us out of the mess that we have created for ourselves for over a century and a half if we don't believe that he has all knowledge in his hands. The, the, the idea, I was driving home last night, I got this, just that idea brings me in, in an awe-inspiring, awe, awe humble position. Who am I, Lord? You've got all knowledge. Who am I to? It should change the way we look at God. It's just one of the attributes. We've had movements in this nation, but only a few have been genuine and prolonged. Why is that? Cumulatively, over the, over the century and a half, or two, two centuries at least, they have failed to produce the dramatic changes in us that the world sees as a nation. We, you think, about, think about the way the world sees us. We, we claim that we're one nation under God. Right? Think, about, think about how the other nations see us and, and what we're doing right now. We're even abusing the word right now in politics. Thinking, thinking that God is going gonna, is gonna to need to learn from us. And you know what we have today? All we really have as a nation today, we have one more day. We, we have today, hopefully. Maybe a week, maybe another month. It's his undeserved grace and mercy allowing us to exist as a nation. When we claim we're one nation under God, it's the patience of the Lord. However, however, I believe we still can turn things around. But the strongholds that we have, even in our own churches, are, are daunting. We know that many people, many people have given their lives in our countries, in, in wars for our freedoms and the ability to live in what once was, we were once the envy of the world, uh, let alone as an example. We need to remember that God can do anything. Why do we question God in, in circumstances? He can do anything. Sometimes he gives us an encouragement. Sometimes it comes in a word from someone. Many times, in an unforeseen event, a dream. We know many of you have had dreams like that. I talked about my dream last night. I won't go into that, but uh, it was quite a dream. Again, God can do anything. Could God at any time... In any manner, receive into his mind knowledge that he did not possess and had possessed from eternity. If he did, he would be imperfect. He would be imperfect and less than himself. To think of a God who must sit at the feet of a teacher, even, even though that teacher be an archangel or a seraphim, whatever you want to call it, is to think of someone other than the Most High God. He is the maker of heaven and earth. God knows exactly how to fix our mess. Amen. And he knows if he will fix our mess. Amen. God knows our next breath, our next heartbeat, our next illness. In this book, Tozer explains that even, even using a negative approach is quite right in explaining his omniscience. You've seen that God has no origin, he had no beginning, and he requires no helpers. He suffers no change. 
and that in his essential being there are no limitations. You see how many no's were there? <laughs> we're explaining God in the negative so that we can understand him. Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31. Has thou not known? Question mark. Has thou not heard, cries Isaiah, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. Malachi 3, verse 6. I am the Lord, I change not. That tells us more than the biggest sermon we can ever possibly come up with. He knows perfectly about himself. He's the source and author of all things. He knows all, look about this, he knows all that could be known. God knows instantly and effortlessly all matter, all mind, every mind, all spirits, every being. He knows all creation, all creatures. He knows every law. He knows every relationship. He knows all causes, all thoughts, all mysteries, all feelings, all desires, and every unuttered secret. He knows every throne, dominion, personality, and things visible and invisible in earth, motion, space, time, life, death, good, evil, heaven, and hell, and on and on and on. He has that knowledge. He never, God never discovers anything. He is never surprised. He is never amazed. He never wonders about anything. Except when drawing men out of their own good does he seek information or ask questions. God is self-existent and self-contained and knows what no creature can ever know himself perfectly. The things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Only the infinite can know the infinite. And so if God has all this knowledge, and I said this last night, this is really interesting, uh, I think the Lord gave me this yesterday. It may go something like this. If God knows everything, then why do we pray if he has the answers? It could be something like this. God may know all things. He may know how things are going to turn out in the future. But is it possible that God has this knowledge, right, but he chooses maybe not to bring it to remembrance or move it to a point where he sees it, but he has the knowledge. Maybe there are multiple outcomes to, to some things that are there, but he chooses not to bring that to remembrance. Maybe, just maybe, by our prayers, we can affect this outcome that he chooses not to remember or to see. Something like that. It's, it's the human mind working through this. And so all the more reason for us to pray <laughs> fervently because God can change a circumstance. But the, the question I have is, are we praying maybe not understanding that God has this infinite knowledge. Many times we pray and ask the Lord for a result that we want. In fact, a lot of our prayers are like that, right? We, we want to see the result the way we want to see it. Instead, and Paul, Apostle Paul knew this, right? Even our Lord Yeshua knew this in the garden, right? If it be your will, Father, if it be your will, Father, take this away from me. Nevertheless, Lord. That's how we need to start praying for everything. 
everything, every person, every everything needs to be prayed in the context that God has the answer. It's already been answered. And we need to defer to that. We need to back up and get ourselves out of our prayers and get into his will with them. And I, I can guarantee you, if we can discipline ourselves to start doing that today, start doing that today. Start starting every, every one of your prayers off with, if it be your will, never and end it with, nevertheless, Lord, the Holy Spirit will speak to us and give us the divine intervention that he wants us to have in our prayers. Sometimes we come with a list. We come with a list of, you know, I need to pray for this. I, this has got to happen. This has got to happen. And you know, God's standing back here. I, I know how this is going to turn out. Do you? Do you know that? You don't, you're not praying that way. Pull back a little bit. Pull back in your prayers and take this idea that God knows everything and that he's going to take the outcome and do it according to his will and, and, and way. If we're in a situation, if we're in a season in your life, you're going through something, oh, man, Lord, get me out of this. Lord, get me out of this situation right now. Instead of saying, God, you've got good in this. I, I am believing that. This is a faith test. This is a test of my relationship with you and trusting you because you have all this knowledge. I'm going to wait on you, Lord. I'm going to get to the point where I'm going to say, I don't care if I have to take my last breath and wait on you. I'm going to wait on you because you're going to do this for good. That's what the Lord wants. That's what the Lord not only wants for his church, that's what the Lord wants for this nation. We, we, we're, we're selfish. We're selfish in our prayers. We, we don't understand completely who our God is and, and, and what we're asking. So just, just a little bit of a, of a reminder. Start changing the way you pray. And I'm believing we're going to get testimonies from people that are going to see miraculous things happen. And, and be, don't be surprised if you start doing that, that things turn out maybe in a different way. And maybe God will bring you to another test. He'll say, well, you know, I didn't expect this to happen. You know, well, yeah, that's a test. What are you going to do? Are you still going to pray my will even though it didn't turn out exactly that way? Maybe it's a step. Maybe it's a step toward this and to that, and then when you pass that, you get to that, and then you get to that, then you get to victory, right? But we're not we're an impatient country. We're an impatient society. We want it now. We don't want any more of the pain. We want the pain to go away, right? Even though we're probably the ones that caused it. Amen. We're the ones that caused this. Amen. Yeah. It's an amazing thing to see people who claim to be believers not comprehending that God is not going to extend us grace. He's not going to extend us grace that's going to negate his word. He's not going to give you something that's going to go against his word. And... You know, I'm going to go back to this, this idea of prayer. I talked about this this morning. Finished the book of James today, James 5. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to James 5.16. Right? What does it say? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. What is a righteous person? A righteous person who's cu who is a person who's come clean. He's come clean. One of the things we don't do enough of is confessing. Confessing to other people sometimes. Uh, if, we've, if we've had brokenness with them. You know, here's what we do. This is amazing. We go to God. We go to God one and we say to God, 
Lord, would you forgive me for what I said or did to this person? Right? Instead, right, God's the still small voice is saying, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. But I would really like you to pick up the phone and come clean with that person. Don't come to me necessarily and ask me to fix it. You need to do something. Amen. You need to step forward. A lot of our prayers we're praying right now is we pray things and then we don't do anything. We, you know, we, we, we just pray, you know, faith without works is dead, right? Our faith in prayer needs to be followed up with action. Action. If we've offended a brother, we're supposed to go to him. Not just go to God and say, would you please help me, Lord? Yeah. <laughs> and that goes with a lot of other things we've done. Help me with my, you know, you can, you can just name it. Help me with my issue with this or that. Okay, I hear your prayers. Now, if you're asking me to help you with that, this is what I'd like you to do. You don't hear that part. You hear the first part. You say the same prayer the next day, and the next day, and weeks go by, and you wonder why you're not getting a breakthrough. Then you come here and ask for prayer. It's the same voice. He's going to speak to you and tell you the same thing. You need to do this or do that. Go through our life spinning our wheels, spinning our wheels, spinning our wheels as a nation. It's an infection. It's an infection in the church today. It's causing us to be stale, man, like really stale. We're stuck. We're apathetic. We don't think we can do anything about our situation. Meanwhile, we've got people in high places who are moving along with their agenda. Moving along. And... We, we, we need, number one, to humble ourselves. Let's just start with the first two things. To humble ourselves and pray. Humble ourselves is taking what we know about God, right? That he's omniscient. He's self-sufficient. He's in three persons. We, we need to get a deeper understanding of who he is to produce the humility that we need in order to start the process of healing the land. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, that's where we are as a nation. We haven't even started the first step. We've got to get, we've got to get to a point where we understand what it really means to be humble, and that is, is understanding who God is more, understanding his attributes, and then we'll see the Lord move. Otherwise, look, I'm just, I'm just telling you, we're in for a rough time. The, the, on, the only way God is going to step in into this country right now uh, without us doing something is by his, just his divine providence of us, of him coming to us and doing something miraculous which we don't deserve. And how many times has he done that? How many times has he done that in this nation? And we've responded, thanks, Lord. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm good right now. And my bills are less. I'm paying less for fuel. My life's a little better. I can afford my bills. Thank you, Lord. Now I've got more time to do this. It's, it's, it, no, you need to take the, more, the, 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 the blessing and spend more time with the Lord. That, it, 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 it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. So Take this, take this to heart today. Um, understand that he's got everything in his hands. He knows the beginning from the end. And if you take one thing away from this message today, change the way you pray for things. Pray, if it be your will, Lord, nevertheless, 
frame your prayers around that, and you will get the blessing of the Lord in the outcome. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm going to do the offering now. Lord, you blessed us with another, another Shabbat, another Shabbat of freedom, another chance to glean the truths of your word. Lord, I just ask that you anoint all the givers today, but most importantly, Lord, that you take uh, this word tonight and put it, or today, and put it into our hearts, that we take it home. Lord, let this change the way we pray. Let this change the way we think. And let this, Lord, be the beginning of greater humility in our lives. In Yeshua's name, amen. All right, let's bless the Lord. Praise the Lord. Actually, I think we're going to do, looking at this, we're going to do uh, New Covenant Passover, so um, let's go ahead and do that. I was encouraged yesterday we had somebody come in and, and said that as they were driving in, uh, they saw a lot of churches, you know, parking lots were packed, so that was pretty encouraging. So we are reminded, you know, m much of the world sees this week uh, as Holy Week and the foundation uh, is the resurrection. So um, we're still a couple of weeks away from, from, from uh, doing Passover, but the Lord said to celebrate this as often as you can, this new covenant Passover. So we're going to be doing that today. Let's see if we can bring up the... Uh Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotze Lechem Min HaAaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, king of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, reminds us that Yeshua is the bread of life. On the night he was betrayed, he said this, take this and eat, do this in memory of me, partake.
He also said this, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, Melech ha'olam pore pri ha'gafen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine and reminds us that Yeshua is the first fruits. This is the cup, the cup of the new and everlasting covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. Partake. Now let's worship the Lord. Alan said we're going to have a small own egg uh, after service honoring Pastor Anita, so join us after that. Amen. Lifting me up from the ground Love is the power Where our freedom song is found Ain't no grave Ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down There ain't no grave Ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down when I hear that shofar sound, I'm gonna rise up out of the ground. Ain't no grave, ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. Fear is a liar with a smooth and velvet tongue. Fear is a tyrant. Always telling me to run. Oh, love is a resurrection, and love is a trumpet sound. Love is my weapon, I'm gonna take my giants down. Ain't no grave, ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. When I hear that shofar sound, I'm gonna jump up on the ground. Ain't no grave, ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. Oh, there was a battle, a war between death and life. And there on a tree, the Lamb of God was crucified. And he went on down to hell, and he took back every key. He rose up as a lion, and he set all captives free. Ain't no grave, ain't no grave. Gonna hold his body down. No grave to hold his body down when he 
heard that shofar sound He rose up out of the ground Ain't no grave Could hold his body down up in walk, I'm walking too. Yes, you arose up in walk, I'm walking too. Yes, you arose up in walk, I'm walking too. Ain't no gray gonna hold my body down. I look into the heavens. What do you think I see? A band of holy angels And they're coming after me Ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down Hear that shofar sound I'm gonna jump up out of the ground Ain't no way Ain't no way Gonna hold my body down This is an old one. I am weak, but thou art strong. Yes, you keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk, let me walk close to thee. Just a closer walk with thee Granted Yeshua is my plea Daily walking close to Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Through this world of toil and snares, if I Falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? 
none but thee, O Lord, none but Just a close walk with thee. Friends, if you sure is my plea. My feeble life is old. Time for me will be no more. God. Thy kingdom shore, O oh Lord, to thy shore. Just a closer walk with thee. God of Israel, elders bow and worship as the angel voices swell. Fragrant clouds of incense swirl around your throne of grace. Lord, we bow at the brilliance of your face. We cry holy, 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 holy is the Lord. We 
Eternal God, unchanging, mysterious and unknown. Your boundless love, unfailing in grace and mercy shown bright seraphim in ceaseless flight around your glorious throne they raise their voices day and night in praise to
eternal God unchanging mysterious and unknown your boundless love unfailing in grace and mercy Bright seraphim in ceaseless flight Around your glorious throne They raise their voices day and night In praise to you alone Are there Hallelujah, glory be to our great God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory be to our great God. Everybody, hallelujah. You know, when we go to Israel and we go to the tomb, the garden tomb, which I think is probably the real place where his tomb was, I always point out to everybody on the tour the Roman molly bolt in the wall. A lot of people don't know about it. But when the stone rolled away, 
There was an iron molly bolt holding the stone in place. And uh, and Pilate, that's what he meant by when he said he sealed the tomb. He put a iron pin, once the stone got rolled in front of the tomb, he put an iron pin to make sure that nobody could roll the stone back. And a Roman molly bolt, all that means is they drill a hole in the rock, they pour molten lead in it, then they drive a steel pin into it, or, or iron pin. So not very easy for anybody to, to get through that pen. You can see it in Jerusalem today. When you go to the garden tomb, you can see the pen that was broke off on the inside yeah. in the lead. You can still see it today. Most people don't even know it's there. But when we were singing that song, you know, no grave is going to hold us down. No grave is going to hold Yeshua down. So much so that the stone rolled away and snapped that iron pin. There was nothing that was going to hold him back. And just like what the pre has for us, as a promise to us, there is nothing that's going to hold us back. When he decides it's time, and that great shofar blows, and it's time for us to go, there is nothing that's going to hold you back. Nothing held him back, and nothing will hold us back. Amen. So I think about that every time I see that Roman molly bolt in that wall, right where you see the stone rolled in, and they put it right there so the stone couldn't roll back. You can see it right there, and I think about that, you know. Death couldn't hold him down. Death is not going to hold us down. That's what the scripture says. You're appointed to die once. And then judgment. And to die, you're going to be immediately before the Lord if you're a believer. Immediately before him. God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a man that he's ever learning. Like some religions teach. He knows it all from the beginning. He made it all from the beginning. He knows it all. And whatever his word says, believe it, it's going to happen. Amen. As he said. Amen. Amen. All right. Okay, Pastor Denny. Hallelujah. Amen. I read something just recently in the news. They did a survey, and they said only 30% of the people now attend worship services regularly. Amen. Ten years ago, it was at 40%. Now it's, 10 per, now it's 30%. 10% 10 drop in 10 years. <laughs> like Thessalonians say, that the son of perdition will not come until there is a falling away. Mm -hmm. Folks, we've fallen off the cliff. <laughs> Wherever the way the world goes, that is not our way. Amen. So we will worship and honor God no matter what Amen. else happens out there. Amen. Great amount of persecution going on out there around the world today. But we will honor our God and love our God. Amen? Amen. Let no one take that away from you. And don't ever forget to worship and honor him, no matter what you're going through. The Lord commanded Aaron and his sons to say this blessing so that the name of the Lord will be upon them. Isa Adonai Panavaleka Bissim Lecha Shalom 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you peace. The peace of the Tsar Shalom. The peace the world cannot have and neither does it know. But you know, you know the peace of the Messiah. So count yourself blessed for you know it and you live in it and you bathe in it and you speak of it and you eat of it all the days of your life in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless everybody. Join us in the Oneg outside. <laughs>